Hello, and welcome to lecture one of the complete guide of InfluxDB 2. My name is, <laughs> wow, confusing. My name is uh, David Flanagan. I will be your guide to InfluxDB 2. And uh, I just want to start these sessions by talking a little bit about how they're going to work and the other future sessions that will be coming soon. So live courses on the Rock Hold Academy are a mixture of live streams just like this, which will be driven by some live coding, some slides like we'll see today, and live Q&As. We'll be doing these multiple times per week to just try and engage and make sure that the course material is being absorbed and consumed and you know we're all learning. There will also be uh, pre-recorded videos which accompany each of these live sessions which will break down into smaller components each of the each of the sections of the workshops that we'll be tackling and, and playing with over the next days and weeks. So they're multifaceted. I really hope you enjoy them. I would love any feedback that you as incubating members are happy to give to me. So jump into the Discord. Don't forget, rocko.chat is the best place to come in. There is the Incubating Lounge. If you're not already added to the Incubating Lounge, and there are a few of you that I know are not in there, then remember to connect your YouTube and your Discords together so you can join the other members and chat about these courses. And also please make suggestions for other courses you want to see coming along in the Rockwood Academy. I will do my best to make that happen, either guided by myself or guided by friends that I've got in the community, a cloud native community. Okay, that being said, we're gonna to start today's first live session. This should be around 30 to 40 minutes long. We're going to talk about the history of time series, and then I'll give you a little bit of information on what is coming next week. Let's get started. So this is an introduction to time series, lecture one in this course. Let me get my mouse in the right place. Mouse, mouse, there we go. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a pop quiz. I don't just want to throw the time series at you and be like, hey, this is time series. Like, let's make it a little bit fun along the way. So we're going to start with a little bit of a pop quiz just to talk about the history of computing and time series side by side. Uh, and we'll see how we go. on. Now, I know I can't receive any of your answers because of the, what is that annoying thing in the corner? Yeah. <laughs> I know I can't take any questions from you right now, but that's okay. And um, feel free to leave them in the comments. I will do my best to tackle them. Encoding. Now, when I talk about encoding, I'm talking about as you know, computer scientists and engineers, or programmers, whatever you want to call yourself, um, is our ability to transfer some piece of information in a format that isn't the raw format. You know, Base64 would be an example of encoding, our ability to translate messages into other formats. And when we think about this, you probably think that this relatively new. I'll give you two seconds to pick your numbers in your head and see if you're close. One, two. And the answer is no. Encoding, well, not specifically to do with computers, of course, but encoding goes back many, many, many years. First used, at least as far as I could see, in 410 BC. And I found this documented in the lives of the noble Grecians and Romans by Roman historian Plutarch, where Plutarch is telling us about the story of Alcibiades. Alcibiades was a mercenary who had a fleet of ships and people by his side, and he didn't really have allegiance to anyone except himself. So when Alcibiades would show up to a, a, a war in the seas, it wasn't until he raised a sign that people knew which side of that battle Alcibiades was going to be on. So that's encoding a message of support through a flag on a ship. Now, of course, it, it took a long time before this system really changed. Uh, you know, according to everything I can find online about flag systems, uh, it wasn't until the 14th century that they actually evolved to have like two signals, and that was like one or two flags. And this is from the Black Book of Admiralty. Although just a hundred years after that, things did evolve much quicker. I think people realized maybe there was a flaw in their one and two flag system. But by the 15th century, they had 15 flags, and each flag had a different encoding or message, symbol, etc., 
on the flag, which all had different meanings. So you had to understand what each of the flags meant to know which message was being passed. And then a few hundred years later, we have the French system, which I will fail to pronounce, uh, which has 10 colored flags, each representing zero to nine. And generally, these ships would have three sets of those flags, been able to transfer tuples of information to the other ships with a big book to look up which each system means. Now, I'll do one more of these. Of course, based on the encoding one, you know that I'm using the term encoding loosely. The same will be true for sharding. So I'll give you a few seconds to guess. When do you think sharding or what was the oldest reference to anything I could find that resembled sharding? And I'm going back to 150 BC this time. And the first documented <laughs> example of sharding I found was actually described by Polybius. And this is talking about the way that the ancient Romans transferred messages on the battlefield. Common theme, but not important to today's conversation, is that ancient battles drive the innovation of their time. Now, what the ancient Romans were doing was splitting their alphabet into five parts and using tablets. So they would have five tablets and they would use these to transfer messages really, really quickly, or at least, yeah, they would be used as a translation tool for them to translate the message. And uh, each tablet would have five letters on it. Here's a, a photo from ancient Rome. So they were using fire to actually send these messages many, many distances. But what this system would do, it'd say, okay, we've got two flames on the left. That means we want to look at the second tablet. And then the five flames on the right means look at the use the fifth letter on that tablet. And you can imagine they're raising these fire flames super, super quick. They can translate and send those messages hundreds of miles, depending on how far, depending on what they're using to burn and what kind of smoke they're getting. But this was the way that they won wars. Very cool. Uh, a lot of these tidbits came from the early history of data networks. You can go and buy this book. It is quite expensive, uh, but from start to finish, it is just a, such a fun read, and I couldn't recommend it more to people. Okay, so let's get on track. This is the talk about InfluxDB, and we want to understand use cases for InfluxDB. And the best way to do that is to quickly take a look at the history of time series before we break down what time series actually is. So... Let's let's see. I guess, you know, having that pop quiz at the start, um, we see that, you know, the ancient Romans did drive a lot of this, um, or at least some familiarity of these concepts that we have in modern times, is that when it comes to, uh, when it comes to time series, the Romans did that first too. And in fact, there's this great paragraph that says, uh, I won't read it verbatim, but you know the things that are highlighted here are legal bodies sold to public investors and traded, and the values of these shares fluctuated over time. Now, it doesn't say time series here, but of course the Romans must have had a way of tracking the value of the fluctuations of these commodities over time to understand as the organization or the legal body doing well is up going down etc and been able to pay out those dividends to the public investors so yeah time series is old even though it seems to be like something we can consider pretty modern some little facts for you is that the first ever ipo was the dutch east india company in 1602 the first u.s ipo wasn't until 1873 and that was the bank of north america and then it wasn't until 1984 someone asked a question about the price of wheat. Why is this important? Well, this is the first documented usage of the actual term time series that I could find. So this is the first time anyone had ever put those two words together that was in some sort of logged and written form that could tra travel the years to today. But in 1884, this uh, paper was published in the Journal of Statistical Society of London, which was building comparisons and looking at the fluctuations of the price of wheat correlated with the value or the import price of cotton and silk into Great Britain. So trying to work out, 
you know, if we are importing more cotton and silk, the price of wheat going up or down, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's not a paper I would encourage you to go and read. Of course, it's not that long, so feel free. But it's just, it was a very nice find to see time series mentioned in this way. And of course, just having that paper, at least the first one I could find, that was applying statistical mathematics to the dimension of time, I found really interesting. Okay, so... Uh, my former boss, Paul Dix, the CTO of InfluxDB, once said that most data is best understood in the dimension of time. And I think that is one of the truest things that I ever said. Uh, and I'm looking forward to taking you on this journey of time series and InfluxDB too, and helping you understand your time series, your data, and your systems. Okay, with that being said, what is time series data? Well, we're going to cover that. <laughs> we're going to take a look at... Um, what are time series databases? Some you may be familiar with, some you may not be not. I will get you acquainted with the vocabulary of InfluxDB. And uh, I really want to talk about the value of time series data. When we talk about time series data, it's very simple to talk about the collecting and storing and querying of that data. But there's something much more important that has to be understood, and it's grasping the value and longevity of that data and being able to work with it accordingly. And then we'll talk about a little bit of those more advanced use cases for time series. And this, will, this is some of the stuff that we will be covering over the next couple of weeks on this course. Okay, so what is time series data? I'm going to keep it simple. And it is any piece of data with a timestamp. That is it. It's really, really that simple. If you have a value and a timestamp, you can track the change of that value over time. And that is time series data. I'm going to try and do this through an example, and I'll try and just move my face out of the way a little bit. <laughs> uh, what we have here are events, things that could happen in your infrastructure. Here we can see that the memory is 100%. We can see a health check failed. We can see a database migration has been run, and a whole bunch of other things. But they don't mean much in this form. Get my mouse back. But what we can do is try to identify what these events potentially represent. And what we can represent, or at least what we can try to infer from these events, which are ready pinky color, is that these are cause for concern. These are events that maybe I would want some alerting on. Like if a health, a health check failed, I probably want to know about it, depending on how many of them happened and what space of time. More on that in a couple, well, more on that next week. <laughs> uh, memory hit 100%. Yeah, I probably definitely want to know about that. That seems quite dangerous. And pods being killed by the arm. Yeah, of course. Right? These are important events I want to understand. Now, in the yellow color, what we see is potential causality. So a, a database migration ran, pod restarted, a new version of our container was deployed, and we have CI passed and started. Now, these events are not particularly malicious themselves, but they do have the ability to mutate state. Something in the system has changed. And change is always the cause of one of the red ones, right? Something has to happen for bad things to happen. Purple, what do we see in purple? In purple, we see nothing. Really, these are events that we'd probably just want to discard. We would not consider these things that could cause too much change or too many problems within our system. And of course, the red herring and pink at Scotland qualifying for the World Cup. It's never going to happen. Now, these events, while we can infer what they mean and we can try to guess what is happening in the system and its current state and its current visualization, we just have no idea. We are flying blind. However, if we apply the dimension of time, move me back down, if we apply the dimension of time to these events, we actually get a really strong understanding of what happened in the system. We can actually see that the memory hit 100%. We then see that the arm killed the pod. We were probably using the latest tag, which triggered a new deployment of our application, maybe one we weren't ready to deploy just yet. 
That caused a migration to run in our system again, which we were not expecting, and now our health check is failing. We now know what happened, and all we did was, was replay these events in the order that they happened, or at least visualize them in the order that they happened to build the understanding. So most data, and data as events with points in time, are always best understood in this fashion. And that is why time series is so important, and why we're putting this course together on InfluxDB2. There we go. Now, you may already be familiar and have lots and lots of time series data. This is a screen that, while the words may not be familiar right away, nor even probably visible to you, depending on your screen, but we've all really familiar with this, right? This is some log being tailed. Now, what is the first thing that we always get at the start of a log line? It is typically a timestamp. Logs are classical time series data. These are events that happen over time that can be aggregated into metrics. And I want to make that last little point really clear. All metrics, every single metric in the world, and you can bring me all the metrics you want to the Discord, Every metric is an aggregation of some series of raw events. Challenge accepted. Bring me a metric that isn't, I will concede, but it's not going to happen. But what we really want to understand here is metrics are aggregations always, events of the raw form, and we have to make trade-offs and understandings of when to store which. That will also be covered uh, either next week or the following week as we dive into InfluxDB more. Okay, so what is time series data? Well, there are two different types of time series data, as I just kind of covered in that log bit there, but I really want to make sure that we understand the difference. So regular time series, these are aggregated um, events or metrics, are predictable and evenly distributed. Now, what I mean by that is that I should be able to get the value for a metric at any given interval, and it should be consistently available. If we think about the CPU load average of a Linux system, is that I can request that value from the kernel every one second, every five seconds, every minute. Entirely up to me, but there will always be a value. Much like the temperature. I can always use a thermometer to get a temperature. Irregular time series, or the raw form slash events, are unpredictable and very inconsistent. An example here would be if I am working on a ticketing system for a football stadium, I don't know when the next person is going to scan their ticket. But I can tell you how many people are in the stadium through an aggregation of the ticket scans over a certain window. We'll dive into this, into this more, and from probably here on in, I will always reference them as metrics and events rather than regular and irregular, because it's the vocabulary that you're probably more familiar with and that we all use every day in the software and technology world. Now, good examples of, of metrics are CPU usage. You know, I cover this and I mention that all the time because it's the one that we're all really familiar with. Memory usage is another one. I can always get a value for how much memory is being consumed. I can always get a ping time for google.com, even if it's indefinite because it's not up. <laughs> and I can always get the number of processes from a kernel as well. So these are metrics, and these are values that change over time. Great examples of events. You cannot predict when a user is going to click the login button, no matter how hard you try. You cannot predict when someone is going to get their uh, password or username wrong to log into your system. You have no idea when the next CI build is going to be published, and you definitely have no idea when a network engineer is going to trip over a rack and pull out a cable. Now, these are still important events, and we can build ag uh, aggregated metrics from it, but they are irregular and unpredictable. Now, I'm not going to sit on the screen for too long, but I always like people to really try and cement their knowledge of what are metrics and what are events by looking at a very common example. Right? If you're a sports fan, I don't even watch football. I don't know why I keep using this, but you know, a lot of people do watch football. Um, and just by looking at this, there are so many examples of metrics and events just in this screenshot. So I'll pick a couple. Um, but if you want to try it yourself, feel free to pause the video now uh, and see how many you can come up with. Now, 
the metrics that we have available to us, we can kind of already see. Um, we have a score, right? We can see that Liverpool are beating Barcelona 2-0, and that is 3-2 on aggregate. Those are, are two different metrics. But we also have the raw form of that, the events that contributed to the score. We can see that it, those two players scored at 7 minutes and 54 minutes, and that gives us an aggregated score of 2-0. If we had, the, well, I'm sure someone has the event data, but we can also see the other three goals for Barcelona and the first leg of the match. So those are the events. Um, if there were any corners, free kicks, red cards, yellow cards, those are more events that happened in the game that could be tracked. The number of people in the stadium is a metric. The events are the people scanning in and out of the stadium and so forth. So there's a lot of time series data all around you, everywhere you go, every day of life. Time series data cannot, um, you cannot unsee it when you know that it's there. So again, I think it's just super important. All metrics are aggregations of events. Um, and it just, that should hopefully help your understanding of this as we move forward. So the next thing that we want to get comfortable with when we'll be doing this in action on the next video is collecting time series data. Now you can do this through Prometheus exporters, which you may be familiar with if you're already working with Kubernetes, or you can use a tool like Telegraph. It's entirely up to you. They're all great. They all do a wonderful job. It just depends on where you're going to be storing them. Because this course is going to focus on InfluxDB2, we will be using Telegraph for the majority of our metric collection. Telegraph is a really cool tool because it has inputs for almost everything. It's got at least uh, <laughs> at least a few hundred input plugins uh, where it can read uh, metrics from you know Kafka, Kubernetes, Linux, Puppet, uh, TLS certificates is a really cool one. Um, it has remote support for HTTP endpoints, gRPC endpoints, etc. It can write metrics to anywhere. Again, we'll be using InfluxDB2 for this course. And from Prometheus, there's always or generally always an exporter equivalent to the plugin. Which always brings us to uh, the wonderful debate push versus pull. Now, for metrics, pulling them is fine. Why? Because they're always available. They are consistently and predictably available. If I want to pull metrics on a 10 second, 20 second, one minute, hour basis, then that works. You cannot pull events. You cannot pull the raw form because they're unpredictable. So you actually need a combination of both which is why I always push people in favor of tools like Telegraph, because it can handle both scenarios. So you definitely need both. Understand that for metrics, it's okay to pull. It's encouraged to pull. For events, you definitely need push-based system, regardless of what you choose. Now, use cases for time series data. Why is this course going to be important to you? Well, if you're coming from a cloud native or Kubernetes background, you probably want to do monitoring. You're probably working with infrastructure. You're probably writing applications. You're probably consuming third party services. You need to understand how well they're functioning and where problems arise for good, strong root cause analysis. If you're into IoT and sensorification of the real world, then you maybe have too many Zigbee, Raspberry Pis, and other devices around your home. And you can do so much cool stuff with all of the metrics that those are emitting day in and day out. And if you are, you know, you have your own website, your own blog, you track your Twitter performance, your YouTube performance, things that are important to me, then real-time analytics from all of these services provide really fantastic time series data. Okay, now when it comes to the TSDBs of choice, this course is focused on InfluxDB2, but there are others. But the thing that I think is important for right now is a lot of people do store their time series data in general purpose databases. And there are a few reasons that that's not going to work. Firstly, time series data is generally high write frequency, right? Especially with IoT and sensorification. It's that we are writing these real world metrics um, at milliseconds, sometimes nanosecond frequencies or resolution, as particularly with um, you know, uh, high velocity, high frequency trading in the financial markets. The way that we read data from a time series data is also wildly different from a general purpose database. And we're generally scanning large chunks of data over a particular time window. So you really want a database that is built for that purpose. 
And then the last part of this session today is going to be talking about the value of time series data and time to live and life cycle management and time sensitivity of that data is really, really important and something that you wouldn't get through a general purpose database. So again, why is this course important? Well, if we take a look at the trend over the last, I think, 24 months. In fact, that was, this is last year's graph. I really need to update this. Um, we can see that time series databases are the fastest growing database category. And that's because of this migration to cloud native in Kubernetes. As we build more and more distributed systems, we need the tools, the knowledge, and the understanding to be able to operate them efficiently. Time series databases do that. Now, there was a really cool um, poll that was done by the new stack that was asking, do you store your time series data in a time series database? And only 12% of those people said yes. So I'm here to see if that is true. And if not, I want to show you the truth. Plus, I just really like Rick and Marty. Now, you're probably all familiar with New Relic. Um, it's expensive. So, you know, if you work for a large organization, you may be familiar with it. Otherwise, you may not. And if you're not in a large organization, you're probably more familiar with Datadog. And even to some degree, Google Analytics. These are all time series databases as well. They just, sometimes we don't really think of them in that way, but they are tracking metrics and events that change or happen on over time. So I'm not entirely sure that the new stack survey took that into account. And I don't think it's, as, I think more than 12 people, more 12, 12 people, I think more than 12% of people are using time series databases for their time series data. Uh, here's a question I threw on Twitter a long time ago, but still has resonated and stuck with me ever since. But I, I asked, you know, I run Kubernetes in production and I monitor it with. And there's like a thousand responses to this. And 74% of people said Prometheus, which I thought was great. 3% used InfluxDB. Yep, that's all good too. Uh, there was some new relic and data dogs, but 13% of these people said nothing. 13% of people are not monitoring your Kubernetes. That is really scary. So I hope if you're in that 13%, you're watching this course, and you're going to learn how to monitor Kubernetes with InfluxDB2. That is our goal. That is one of the end achievements to this course, is you will have pitch-perfect monitoring of your Kubernetes system. Okay, so it's not too late. Let's take a look at InfluxDB. Now, none of this is unique to InfluxDB. This time series introduction thing will probably be the same introduction to time series that I give if there is a Prometheus course down the line. So this is widely um, translatable to any time series database. So please, even if you're not that interested in using InfluxDB, you want to use Prometheus or you want to use M3 or you want to use Thanos, all of this is still completely relevant, at least this one particular episode. So as far as the introductions go, it's a time series database. It is completely open source. They're currently on their second version. InfluxDB considers itself full stack, and it has a UI. It has a stream ability to work on the stream of data and a whole bunch of other things. Now, the vocabulary when working with time series data is typically that we talk about points. So, you know, at any point in time, this, that this being context, was value in. And if we look at the example of this, then we can say that the load average on the machine VM1 was 6.32 at the one minutes. Uh, as you know, if we're talking about load average, it's been 1, 5, and 15. Uh, 8.2 on 5 and 9.55 on 15. We also have a timestamp in orange. We have to track the time this value was recorded, otherwise, it's not time series data. Uh, and as far as InfluxDB is concerned, the, the values are fields. And the context, the tags, the series is the bit on green. So typically, we would call the load to be the measurement. The host would be a tag key, and VM1 would be a tag value. And we break that down here too. So we have the name, or the measurement name at least, in yellow. Tag keys in green, and tag values in blue. Now, tags are indexed, so it's really important to make sure you get that distinction as cor <laughs> correct as soon as possible when you start storing your time series data. Uh, here's another example where we could say that the series changes, even though the market is the same, the ticker is different. So the series is actually a tuple of the measurement name and the tag keys and the tag values, and that's important too. 
um, especially in around well we'll touch on it a little bit next week but more so the following week when we start to really understand how to use flux to query and build dashboards with this time series data understanding what a series is is particularly important now, when you're trying to decide what to do with your time series data, what to store is tags and fields. Remember, tags are indexed and always strings because of that constraint, whereas fields are not indexed and you can use multiple data types. Now, I, I think the value of time series is the most important part of today's session. Yes, everything we've covered so far from the fun to the, the intricacies of time series is hopefully really relevant and I hope you enjoy it. But I think this part here um, is super important to understand because as you come from your development engineering SRE background, and if you haven't worked with time series before, you may fall into the trap of storing a data forever. And it's really important that you don't do that because it's really expensive. <laughs> very, 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 very expensive. So um, maybe my cursor back, there we go. So when we talk about time series data, we will talk about frequency or resolution. Um, language is interchangeable almost, but I, I prefer to use um, high, <laughs> high and low resolution. And when we talk about resolution, we're talking about the interval, that predictable interval of the metrics and how often we collect that, that data. So a 10 second resolution means we collect the values every 10 seconds. 10 nanosecond resolutions mean we collect every 10 nanoseconds and so forth. A one hour resolution is a lower resolution than 10 seconds, which is higher resolution because we collect the value more frequently. Now, the value of the time series data that we collect is directly correlated with the resolution that the data is available or collected. Meaning, yes, storing uh, time series data at 10 second resolution is potentially or definitely more valuable to you than collecting it at an hour because you will have much finer understanding of those values changing over time to be able to do predictive analytics, anomaly detection, and a whole bunch of other things on it. If you only collect the value every hour or even like every day, it's not as valuable to you anymore. Think about the weather patterns in your region. If you check the value every day at noon and see that it's 25 degrees Celsius, it doesn't tell you anything else about that day. If you collect the, the temperature every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, you then have a much better picture of the daily cadence or, um, or patterns of that temperature over months, years, decades, and centuries. So the cost of time series data is in storing that resolution. And I'm going to do this through example. Let me drag my face again. So cursor, very, very professional this course. <laughs> so here's an example. We're going to use load averages. I'm hoping that you're all familiar with this. So we're here, we have a, a machine. We have a single tag, machine equals ABC1. We're collecting the CPU measurement. I've, I'm not going to call it load average. I'm not going to do 1, 5, and 15. We're just doing single, single usage for now. And then we have a timestamp. Now, for us to monitor this machine, we have a single measurement, the CPU, one series, which means one machine, at one second resolution, which means collecting a CPU value every one second, that is 86,400 points per day. Now, as we run through this scenario, please, please try and think about using a general purpose database, your database of choice, whether it be MariaDB, Postgres, MongoDB, Cassandra, whatever, and try to think about how the, the burden or the tax you would have to pay to store these values. So 86,400 probably doesn't make you uncomfortable. You're probably okay with that every day. Now, if we have two machines on our infrastructure, because it's unlikely we have one machine, so we have two series, we've still got one measurement, we're only tracking the CPU, and we're still doing one second resolution. We double that value. 272,800 points per day. We're probably still okay with this, regardless of which database you're using. Okay. Let's assume we have 10 machines, still one second resolution. Only this time, we're a bit smarter. We know we don't just worry, we, we, we know that we're not just worried about the CPU of our machine. We're worried about the memory. 
and we care about disks and we care about network and maybe there's something else on there. But five measurements. We're now at a much larger number because we've got 10 machines and five me measurements at one second resolution. So we're now tracking millions of points per day. And, you know, infrastructure is not typically 10 machines, right? We're, we probably have a lot more than that, especially for production. And we definitely have a lot more than five measurements. We're not just tracking five superficial metrics from a Linux host. Our applications emit hundreds, if not thousands of metrics. But I don't know what your infrastructure looks like, so I'm going to use the NASDAQ as an example instead. And we're just going to track one measurement, which is the cost or price, the share price of a, a ticker on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ has 3,300 roughly companies. And we're going to do one millisecond resolution. Yeah, because, you know, it's financial trading. You need these values. But look at that number. And that's... I don't, I don't even know what that number is. I'm not going to try to guess. Let's just say it's billions. It is definitely billions. But points per day. Imagine storing this in your database of choice. But in a time series database, yeah, it's, it's a lot. But it's manageable. It's definitely doable. Because time series databases are built to handle this particular use case. Now, if we drop the resolution... And this is the most important part now, is that we're talking about resolution change in time series data. So we've went from one millisecond to one minute. We're down to a very manageable number of four million again. And if we drop it again to one hour, we're into the thousands. And we're looking at this and we're comfortable, regardless of database, storing this value again. And this concept of changing the resolution of data is super important in time series. It's six hour resolution, we could store this in any database, right? We're not going to be worried about 13,000 points per day. Here's my wonderful diagram trying to understand and explain to you the value of time series data. And I drew this myself, shocker. Very, very cool. Now, what we have is that for a certain point in time, collecting data at a 10 second resolution has value X. However, there is a certain point in time, and who knows what that is, right? It's very specific to the types of data you're working with. And as we work through this course, we will, we will spend a lot of time talking about the value of the metrics that we collect. But for now, we're going to keep it superficial. But this value, the value of this data at 10 second resolution is important until a certain point when it isn't. Now, there's normally a, a rather large cliff where it's like it go, the value just drops. And then it's valuable, it's valuable for a little bit more time and drops, and then valuable for a little bit more time and drops, and valuable, like so forth, until the data is just not valuable at all anymore. And one of the things that we really need to get good at and understand as we store more and more metrics and raw events and time series data into our system is being able to understand that if we lower the resolution, we minimize the drop in value. The value of the data is going to be continually. <laughs> The value versus the resolution of the data is going to continue to be is going to be valuable for longer. Wow. Um, so if we can actually take that those values that we store at 10 second resolution, drop them to hourly resolution through calculating a mean as an example uh, over the hour, because we're storing less values, the value increases and the resolution, yes, we change it, but it's still valuable. Then we do it again. After a certain amount of time, we say, okay, we don't need an hour resolution. Let's calculate the mean over six hours. We're storing less data, reducing the cost and the burden of storing that data and increasing the value of that data. Even though the value will increase a little bit because we lose a resolution, as we go further away from the point in time the value is stored, it actually works really well. Eventually, we'll have this really nice cascading downsampling system where we take all of our time series data from 10 seconds to one hour to six hours to one day to a week to a month, whatever. It comes down to the types of data you're storing. Again, we will explore this in a lot of detail over the next episodes, the next lectures. So downsampling is really important. And we have to understand when to lower the resolution of each type of data that we store in a system and understand the value that we need from it. Some values, some data, you will need to keep the higher resolution. Some data you will just bend because it's no longer relevant at all. But really, for long-term retrospective analysis of that data, you will want it in some form. 
Now, this is what a continuous query would look like in InfluxDB1. It uses a SQL-like language. Um, this is a lot easier to understand on Flux. We haven't really touched on Flux yet, so I'm not going to show you that. But we will be diving into Flux, and you will see how to do this through Flux tasks. But really what I want you to understand is how the semantics or the pseudocode of a downsample or a rollup would, would look. So you can see here that we create a rollup that runs on a certain bucket or table or measurement. We basically tell it how to calculate the mean, and that could be a min or a max a mean. Um, it could be whatever calculation you want. And we tell it how to group that value. So if we have 10 second resolution, we can group by time of one hour and calculate the mean. And we just let that that down sample run forever doing the thing we need. We chain these together to go from one hour to six hours, from six hours to a day and so forth. So I'm hoping that this InfluxQL version of it helps cement what a down sample will look like and we'll tackle the flux as we move in to subsequent lectures. Now, you cannot down sample events. Feel free to Google anomaly detection with InfluxDB. We will be doing a little bit of it in this course as we try to use HTTP queries to pull out um, you know, 500s, 400s, ones that we didn't expect. So we'll do a little bit of this, but there is a lot of prior research on Google available if this is one of your main drivers for this course. Um, we'll do a little, but not a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now that we have our time series data, we're done sampling it, we've got it in our InfluxDB database, we're starting to put things together. What are some of the things we're going to cover on this course? Well, let's do this by example again. Let's assume you have an application that speaks to a database. I call this the, the simple days, the monolithic days, you know, back in the early 2000s, where this is mostly how we built applications. And if you're still building applications like this, you know what? For some scenarios, it works great. Good on you. Your monitoring is a lot easier than cloud native monitoring. Now, if we want to understand what to monitor in this system, it's really, really, really simple. We typically want to monitor the CPU to go above a certain threshold. That means bad things are going to happen. We want to monitor the memory consumption. Bad things are going to happen. If our customers have a response time greater than 300 milliseconds, bad things are happening. We need to fix it. We may also have predictable problems. Black Friday and other holiday and seasonal items and cadence and things that happen that you will understand within your domain. Okay, so how do we know when to send an alert in this system? Well, we can have an application health check, and if that begins to fail, we send an alert. And if any of those symptoms that we've seen in a previous slide happen, we can send an alert. Really, really simple architecture, really simple to work with. Time series data does not have to be too terribly complex. As we start to bring horizontal scalability, things get a little bit difficult. And this is where time series data, you then need to start manipulating it and working with it in more sophisticated fashions through grouping and windowing and other things. And we're going to cover all of this. But the question here is, how do I know when to send an alert with this system? You know, we can't just use a health check on a single node because we may have two, seven, a hundred other of them that are returning a good health check. Well, oh, my face is always getting in the way. Please stand by. <laughs> so what we could do is an aggregation of our metrics, and we can actually look to see if, you know, using a service level indicators or having a service level objective that we have to meet, whether we have X number of 500 exceptions within N window periods. So whether I have more than 100, 500 exceptions within a five minute period, to me that is a problem that goes against our service level objective. Yes, we definitely have to send an alert. All right. What about cloud native hell? So this is the system we have now, right? We've got service A that speaks to database A. We've got service B that speaks to database B. We've got service B that speaks to the database B because it's horizontally scaled. We've got service C, which speaks to database C, which also has Canadian deployments and progressive deployments. Uh, of course, all of our networking is virtualized because it's on Kubernetes and we're running through a service mesh. Um, help me. How do I know when this system is healthy and how do I know when to page someone? Well, time series data is the answer. So we're going to specifically work on this 
example, we will have a Kubernetes cluster. We're going to have InfluxDB2. We're going to collect data from that cluster. And we're going to break the system, get our alerting into place, and really try to build as much understanding through time series as we can. Now, this is the cloud native architecture, convenience versus cost. So yes, you can still follow along with this course and learn a lot. If you've got monolithic architectures, there's still a lot of great knowledge here to understand. We will be looking at microservices, monitoring them, yeah, using the Prometheus exposition format with InfluxDB2. Um, now, one of the things that we we want this course to help you do is to do root cause analysis and understand causality within your system. So we'll be breaking into some of the statistics. We will be exploring the statistical functions provided by InfluxDB, being able to analyze weeks, months, and years of data using tags to build correlation, looking at how we can use linear prediction derivatives, median absolute deviations, moving averages, whole winters, not machine learning, but statistical learning or statistical predictions based on previous data and cyclic data structures. So if you want to know how to understand the data, this is a really good way to do it. Um, we'll be covering all of these functions at InfluxDB across the next couple of weeks. And some examples here. Um, I like to lean on my own previous life as an SRE here. But, you know, I have been paged at 4 a.m. because a disk usage of a machine went above a certain threshold, which would trigger a pager duty alert and wake me up. Some of the things we'll explore in this course is, well, how can we actually try and predict these outages during office hours? Now, it's not always possible, of course. You know, bad things happen and spikes happen, and those are very difficult to predict. But when we have linear growth of a disk, yes, we want to be able to alert on that before I go to sleep. So we can do that. Uh, we can also use, you know, our, we have distributed applications, distributed HTTP requests. We want to be able to use histograms. Now, there are two ways to do histograms in time series data. You can use histograms of metrics where you pre-assign the buckets within your code. There's the slightly better format, but more expensive, and we'll cover that trade-off as well in the coming weeks, uh, of where I can store the raw events and how long every request took and build dynamic histograms with dynamic bins to understand my application. And in some use cases, you may wish to go down just the uh, pre-allocated bin hard-coded in your code. Again, trade-offs. You have to understand them. You have to understand the risk and the cost with both, and we'll talk about that. Uh, here's an example of the Prometheus one. I'm, I'm saying beware because it's really difficult to change these buckets retroactively, and we'll have examples of this in the next week or two. And proactive operations. One of the really great things I want us to try and take away from this is some of those really cool predictive things that InfluxDB offers, being able to understand and make predictions of previous events. Now, we'll probably use an example like Black Friday in this course where we take a look at you know um, artificial data of three years of a store uh, and see if we can predict what the utilization of our infrastructure will be the following year. And we're going to do that through uh, applying whole winters to the machine, uh, to the time series data that we have in our system. All right, let me pop back over here. So that is our introduction to um, time series data. Now we haven't looked at InfluxDB2 yet. We haven't collected any time series data yet. We haven't stored it, we haven't queried it, we haven't built dashboards, we haven't built alerting, and we haven't done downsampling and analysis of our data. This is the introduction. This is lecture one. There will be many lectures in this course. We will be doing 30-minute to 60-minute videos multiple times per week as we explore time series data via InfluxDB2. I hope this has been a pleasant and enjoyable introduction to this course. Please remember to, if you're not already, sign up and become a Raw Code, <laughs> Raw Code Academy incubating member to see all future episodes on this course. We also have new courses launching in August. We have a course on eBPF as we look at building and trace points into the Linux kernel to do really cool stuff. BPF is a very awesome technology and I'm very excited to share that with you. We also have other courses coming and they will all be announced to incubating members first. So I hope you will join us on this journey. Thank you for supporting this channel. 
I hope you have a wonderful day, night, morning, whatever time you're watching this. And uh, remember to stay tuned. Uh, there will be Q&A sessions and pre-recorded videos coming that will guide you through the workshop course. If you do not have access to the workshop course yet, it is available on GitHub. The link will be in the show notes as soon as possible, again, for incubating members. Have a wonderful day. I'll speak to you soon.